2001. Um, he's currently a faculty member uh, at the University of Washington in the Department of Microbiology. Um, he's leading a research group in computational biology and bioinformatics. Um, so he has done a lot of great work um, in the field of computational genomics, bioinformatics, um, uh, protein structure uh, calculation, and drug design. Uh, he has won many awards. Uh, most recently, the NIH uh, Director's, uh, uh, Director's Pioneer Award. So he's going to be telling us about interactomics. Great. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, title this talk, you know, how Michael Levitt helped me travel the wrong, long road from modeling complex chemical systems to modeling the relationships between them and complex molecular, cellular, and physiological systems, but uh, it was a little long, so I stuck with my original talk title. So I wanted to, I want to start by giving you a background with, uh, of what I did with Michael Levitt initially, and then how that led me to the work I'm doing right now and what I plan to do in the future. So I joined Michael's lab uh, uh, doing, uh, when CASP was, uh, was uh, what do you say, gaining prominence. CASP stands for the Critical Assessment of Structure Prediction, and it was this uh, contest started by John Mould to uh, test uh, prediction methods in a blind way. Until CASP came about, predict, people were making predictions and they were benchmarking it and overtraining the methods and uh, doing well in publications, but the programs weren't doing well when novel proteins were given. So, John came up with this me method of going to crystallographers and NMR spectroscopists to find out what sequences they're working on and then go to uh, the uh, modelers and ask them to build the models before the answer was known. And um, this happened over a, period in, uh, over a period of three, four months during the summer and we'd all get together in December and try to figure out what went wrong. And uh, so, and uh, CAS1 was a big eye-opening experience for us. And at CAS2, I, I, uh, the first methods in comparative modeling started doing well. People like myself and Andre Sari were some of the best predictors. And I joined CAS3 to do de novo structure prediction with Michael Levitt. So I ca with John Malt, I developed these all atom potentials and it was John Malt who told me to you know, you know, take a position with Michael Levitt. And uh, at CAS3, for the first time in de novo prediction, there were a bunch of people, including David Baker, Skolnick, and even Sharaga, so on, a bunch of people who did well in de novo prediction methods. Uh, and we were the first uh, to, to predict the first, you know, according to Alexei Merzin, there were only two novel folds in this whole uh, cast two out of like 30 structures or so. And we were, we were able to get the topological fold right for, that, for those two folds. And, uh, but in general, this was the first consistent de novo prediction seen, and this was at cast three, and this was the work I did with Michael. And in order to do this, I actually took on the work that Michael had previously done with, uh, with um, uh, Britt Park and Jerry Sai and uh, Enoch Huang and uh, also uh, David Hines. So I, I took all this, all this work and combined them in a lattice-based method, a hierarchical lattice-based method for structure prediction. And uh, so we were able to get these methods at CAS3. So at CAS3, we learned that we could, we could actually break the structure prediction problem. And since then, people have been kept uh, uh, developing methods that have gotten better and better. David Baker did well for a while. And then uh, right now, Yang Zhang and people like Soding with uh, HH Search are some of the best, uh, uh, have some of the best prediction methods out there. But I started um, applying this to whole genomes or whole proteomes. So, so not only getting a structure, but also try to get it function. So we developed methods to predict function from structure. And since we could do that for single protein, we started doing this for pairs of proteins and DNA protein complexes as the protein small molecule complexes. And now trying to build atomic models of whole systems. You know, that we built an atomic model of the lac operon with like 20,000 atoms. We developed infrastructure to take all this stuff, integrate it with you know, other kinds of data like expression data. And we started having a lot of applications. My first grant, the UDA was to build the structure and uh, function of all proteins encoded by six rice proteomes, about, about 125,000 proteins total. And uh, we used, the, in collaboration with IBM, we used the World Community Grid and you know, millions of volunteer CPUs to do this work. Uh, we've done some nanotechnology work, you know, trying to you know, develop protein sensors and small molecule proteins that bind to inorganic substrates. And most of my recent work, the, the subject of this NIH Director's Pioneer Award that I got in 2010 was to, was to basically screen uh, small molecules against protein structures. And so we've done that. We've now screened 3,733 small molecules against 48,000 protein structures. And rather than, you know, we can't do docking, like you know, the, the full fragment-based 
docking with dynamics method we have, we can't do it for all the protein. So we, we have a, like a predictive bioanalytics bio method, analytics method, to predict interactions between proteins and small molecules. And so and we give a single value so, uh, for them and you know, idealized it looks like this. There's you know, positive interactions, negative interactions, and neutral interactions. But, uh, uh, you know, so and you create a matrix like this, but in reality, this is the matrix of real values. And so you can look at it both ways. And the underlying this matrix is a very complex relationship network between proteins, compounds, and, and the genes that encode the proteins and so on. And anyway, we developed metrics to look at these compounds as these vectors of real values or even as the, looking at the underlying networks and we compare these compounds this way, right? So, so the way traditional drug discovery works is, you know, you have a single protein and you try to hammer that protein with a, a small molecule and you find one that works and then you hope that it goes through the rest of the, you know, uh, the, the in vivo and the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. But uh, that's not how drugs work. When you ingest a drug, it binds to multiple proteins. We've seen this and, uh, and so, um, so, so the, the traditional model of drug discovery has, hasn't worked for, for, the, for, for a while. And uh, so, so we want to take existing drugs and repurpose them on a large scale. Each of these 3,733 compounds correspond to 2,000 diseases total. And so, so we want to see how each one of these compounds could work for every one of the other diseases. And we do this by comparing these signatures. And we have a complex method of comparison, but, but, it, but it, turn, well, it turns out that using the RMST, the root mean squared deviation of these real values, uh, gives us the best accuracies right now. So we can benchmark the accuracy of this method. So we have a drug, so we can, we have a drug discovery method and we can benchmark its accuracy by seeing how well we can recover the existing drugs that are approved for particular indications. And from, from there, you know, if, we, if, we, if there are 10 drugs approved for diabetes and our method can recover all 10 of them, you know, for, for diabetes, then it's 100% it's uh, accuracy rate. And if it can recover five of the 10 known, 10 known drugs, you know, from the ranking of 3,733 compounds, we say it's a 50% accurate rate. So, so like this, we get a range of accuracies for these different diseases, which are plotted on this axis. This is the other axis, which shows the accuracy if you use a random, randomized matrix where you scramble the rows and columns. So, so using random matrices don't, doesn't give you a very high accuracy. It's like 0.2%, and it's, it's close to what you would expect by chance. Uh, and uh, the average candy accuracy for the top 25 is about 20%, 22% here it's given. That. That's indicated by this light circle in, in, in case you missed it. So this is the benchmarking accuracy. So and we've now done prospective validations for a number of compounds. When I uh, created the slide about a couple of weeks ago, about four weeks ago, uh, uh, we had tested about 79 compounds, and 47 of the compounds showed uh, comparable or better accuracy than a known drug uh, in, 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 vitro, in vitro assays. For herpes, we had found one, one hit that worked for all herpes viruses in vitro, um, all classes of herpes viruses. Uh, for malaria, we had six out of 16 show micromolar inhibition comparable to existing malarial antimalarials. For dengue, for which there's no approved drug, we used initially had a peptide-based method uh, but using this potential from this thing, and two of the four showed microbial inhibition, and uh, based on this recent CANDU protocol, we, had, we tested 27 drugs, and 11 of the uh, compounds showed microbial inhibition against the virus. And uh, MDR, TB, we tested eight, we had four, and lupus, we had one where we could uncover the purity mechanism, and for dental case, we had 10 out of 10 drugs that were bioactive as predicted. And for, for, 12 out of 12, for primary biliary cirrhosis, we had 12 out of 12. So basically, we've done a number of in vitro validations, and we've shown that, um, uh, that uh, uh, now we've actually done about 162, and 57 of them have, uh, uh, have uh, comparable or ex a better accuracy than an existing drug for that indication or micromolar inhibition if the drug isn't known. And this were 11 studies on nine diseases, and we've had one failure with uh, influenza where we couldn't find anything. So, so this method seems to work fairly well. And, um, in, and I've shown this uh, comparison to argonaut, using an argonaut protein and binding small molecules just to argonaut protein. It turns out that you can actually predict, uh, uh, it, it's a useful predictor, you can actually predict uh, the, the existing drugs for these particular indications, HIV infections, uh, hepatitis, and hepatitis, uh, sorry, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and so on. Um, uh, we can predict drugs for these using just a single protein, argonaut, with fairly high accuracy, but still overall, you know, for all, this, uh, for all the diseases, argonaut is, is about, you know, tenfold lesser than, than using the entire 48,000 protein set. So, 
that's, you know, I have 10 minutes to give this talk, so I'm basically cutting out a lot of the, uh, it's, it's a, a lot of the, a lot of the information, but hopefully that was provocative enough for you to go check out our first paper from this project, which was published in Drug Discovery Today uh, about a week ago. Uh, it's an uncorrected proof, but it's out there now on the web. And uh, we, we are now doing prospective violations for about 40 diseases. And uh, like I said, we've tested uh, 160 compounds and 57 of them have worked. We made predictions for all 2030 diseases. And so we can, in this way, you know, you can use a small model. So we created this big matrix, and this matrix is now available on the web. If you want it, I can point you to it. And uh, you can use small molecules to dissect diseases and phenotypes. And my goal is to create an all-atom model of the entire cell, you know, the interactome, so to speak. And uh, so this was a way for me to get funding for, for doing a portion of it, that there's a protein, small, small molecule interactome. And so I, I framed it as a practical translational uh, bioinformatics project. And so, and so and I, the fundamental hypothesis of comparing these signatures would give you better accuracy than the single molecule approach has worked, uh, even though a lot of people don't believe it, uh, uh, but <laughs> are skeptical. But, but it's worked at least in, me, in terms of benchmarking and in terms of in vitro prospective validation. And uh, now we're trying to do some clinical studies with some of our top predictions. And it, this, this, this approach of looking at you know, the, the protein, small molecule, interactome has applications beyond uh, therapeutics. And so I, you know, I want to really say that, that working with Michael was what gave me the inspiration for going from you know, thinking about complex chemical systems to complex, um, uh, complex cellular and physiological systems, but still doing things at the atomic level. So thanks, Michael. And I want to thank also, th this is not a one-man show, and I want to thank a, a lot of my past and uh, present uh, group members, and also I have included a lot of my collaborators there who do the in vitro validations, and also my funding agencies, and it takes a lot of money to do this. So uh, I guess, I don't know how we are going to handle questions at this point, but uh, there's, if there is, uh, yeah, there's time for a couple of questions. Any questions? None? Okay, so Peter, thank you.